Today I'm looking into the recently released Kinetic Inride Power Sensor for their Road Machine and Rock and Roll Fluid Trainers. The previous Inride Sensor was released back in 2012 and had pretty good reviews. Kinetic really have that resistance curve dialed with their units, so they are able to estimate your power quite accurately with just speed. So the newly released Inride Sensor does support industry standards, so AMP Plus FEC and Bluetooth FTMS. Keen observers may remember back in 2016 when Kinetic released their smart control units choosing to go with Bluetooth private and no AMP Plus support whatsoever. That set the community alight with a lot of WTF. It's always a good thing when hardware manufacturers bring their units into line with industry supported standards. But I encountered a slight hiccup with that. This uh, new in-ride sensor with Bluetooth FTMS wouldn't be detected by Zwift iOS or Zwift Apple TV over Bluetooth at this time because Zwift Ride doesn't support FTMS probably only a week or so away. I hope, fingers crossed. It would pick up as a running sensor because Zwift Run supports Bluetooth FTMS. But anyway, small little drama that I've got there, but I found the irony quite funny that people were screaming for Kinetic to support open standards and when they did, the industry wasn't ready for them. Mm. Giddy up Zwift on that one for sure. Now, with all the technical details of the unit out of the way, let's put this unit through the Llama lab test on the Kinetic Rock and Roll, which arrived this week. Something that I do have to point out is the assembly manual here from Kinetic is the best assembly manual I have ever seen for an indoor trainer. Full, glossy and clear instructions to get you up and running straight away. So Kinetic, absolutely brilliant work on this. Everyone needs to do one of these manuals with their trainers. The Kinetic Rock and Roll unit comes pretty much pre-assembled. You just need to take it out of the box, put both the legs on with the supplied hex key, tightening those down. Mounting the bike with the supplied skewer. Now if you do find the unit sways to the left or to the right, you can recenter the bike, as you see I'm doing here, to make sure you're in dead center. Turns on the knob there, it's touching the tire and three full rotations, should give you enough resistance there. Now I am using the Tax Trainer tire at 100 PSI. Okay, just out of interest here, I pulled out the NPE WASP, you can see in the center of the screen there, which will pick up all AMP Plus and Bluetooth devices in the area and tell me what's what and what's being transmitted. So looking here, the existing Bluetooth sensor is not being picked up. It's pretty much an unknown device. As I move that, nothing being picked up. And then once I put the CR2032 battery Expanding those out just to see what information is being transmitted. It all looks pretty good. We'll also put that to the saw though by moving a magnet to and fro. Looks like it's working as expected. Okay, now for the installation, off with the old, without trying to cut my fingers off. Probably better to do that with a flathead screwdriver, but, and placing the new unit in the exact same position. You can see the magnet there on the roller wheel, just above my thumbs. That's what triggers the sensor. Okay, now on with the matching socks and on with the ride to put this to the test. I did find the unit itself not too bad, but probably a little better than the rocker plates that I've used in the past, just given where the thing actually pivots from. There's also a bit of bounce up and down. Something a lot of rocket plates don't have is that up and down bounce. It wasn't too, uh, wasn't too bad, but one thing I did need though was the front steering. As your bike moves side to side, your bike will turn the handlebars. I don't have the kinetic crown, so I decided to make my own a couple of weeks back. Definitely a must have when your bike's moving side to side indoors. Okay, under the calibration process after 10 minutes. You can see here it asks me to speed up to 36 kilometers per hour and then do a straight spin down, but it seems to stop at around 33 kilometers an hour. I did this twice, so I'm not quite sure what 36 kilometers an hour was about, but at 33, it asks you to coast down. Now 
Okay, now into the Llama lab test here, just finishing off the 250 watt section there. So nice and smooth on this device. You can really hold and peg the watts. Into the Sprint here, you can see the power tap pedal is a little bit more responsive as you'd expect. And the speed slash power curve estimator isn't too bad. Up around the 900, low 900 ranges, whereas the pedals themselves are up around the high 900s for a little bit there. We'll deep dive into that data in just a few moments. But still good enough to get the green jersey with not a lot of people on Zwift at that point in time. That's the trick. Now the one thing that really did impress me with this unit is how easy it was to peg and hold these watts. You can see here I'm going into my over and unders. So at 150 watts, I have to choose these watts because it's a non-interactive trainer. There's no erg mode. You can see there I was able to, well, I was probably a little bit excited there, a little bit over 150 watts. But with the power tap and the kinetic unit itself, measuring power in very, very different ways, they are very, very close. So you can see here going up to the 350, I'll overshoot that on the pedals because I have to try and calibrate my own feeling of where 350 watts is. But once I'm there, it can peg and hold those watts very, very nicely. Okay, and the next one is up into the 450 watt range. That should be a fair tester of this. Okay, no erg mode to push back on the pedals. I have to push the pedals myself up to 450 watts. And you can see there that it hits 450, a little bit over. I'm able to bring it down a little bit. But I was able to pass those, no problems whatsoever with the kinetic trainer. So that smooth power curve that it has also translates to the pedals. You can really judge your effort just nicely. Jumping forward to the next 450 watt effort just to make sure the first one wasn't a fluke. Thanks to W Power for the ride on. You can see there I overshoot a little bit on the pedals and then it pegs 450 pretty well. I'm super impressed with this. With what I was seeing on the screen, it did put a smile on my face. This was, uh, it appeared to be a little bit more accurate than some power meters. Back once again to my favorite website on the internet, DC Rainmaker's Analysis Tool, where we can compare multiple power meters up against each other and see how they fare. So standard Llama lab test here, if you're all familiar with that. So steady states, into a sprint, some over and unders, and then some just riding along. So first 10 minutes is pretty much thrown away. We do a calibration around about here. And then from there on, things are looking pretty damn good. So at 200 watts, 200 watts, 200 watts, this is the PowerTap P1 pedals comparing to the in-ride sensor. So effectively virtual power. It's doing it super, super well. So I've heard these things are pretty good. I didn't expect this good at all. So around the 200 watt mark, like one for one, absolutely beautiful data there, nice and clean, no dropouts. Um, up around the 250 watt mark, now around about the 15 minute mark into this, there's a slight separation here. They start sort of separating a little bit. I'm gonna put that down to quite possibly the unit heating up a little bit more and just drifting a little further. If I had it on another calibration, I might get some better data through here. Still within spec of, I think they call it plus or minus 5% for the in-ride, but almost bet, oh, actually it is better than a number of power meters I have tested recently. So very impressive numbers on the screen there early on. Now into the sprint, as we expect, it's not gonna be as quick to respond as the pedals. You can see the power tap pedals jumping up a lot quicker. And it's not too bad, probably off around whoa, 30 or 40 watts at the high end there. So around the 900 watt to 1000 watt range, look, that's acceptable given that uh, plus or minus 5%. Now diving into the data from those short over and under intervals that we saw on screen just before. And look, that's super impressive for this unit. You can see there the power tap pedals will respond a lot faster. They'll also respond a little bit higher because again, no erg mode. I have to accelerate up to speed and then regulate where those numbers need to be. And then they're spot on for the 350, 350, 450. You can see the in-ride takes a little bit longer to come up to speed, up to power, I guess, one and the same for this unit. And uh, the last one there, I just get a bit wonky on the left and right, but that is absolutely brilliant. From there on, there's probably a little bit of separation. Let's just dive in here. Between the two, I'm putting that down again to heat. I probably should have stopped and recalibrated again. But overall, that's absolutely brilliant given it's a $50 device versus a $1,000 pair of pedals here. Jumping to the cadence readings of this unit, it does 
okay-ish, probably off about 10 to 15% on cadence. I really don't know the magic behind this, how it estimates your cadence, but if you really want cadence on your bike, grab yourself a cadence sensor and problem solved. An impressive performance there by the Inride Power Sensor, which calculates your power based on the speed of that flywheel. I did have all the ducks lined up there, so I had a trainer tire pumped up at 100 PSI. I had that turn knob, exactly three rotations and no slippage. So your mileage may vary, but the accuracy I got out of this little thing today was pretty good up against the P1 pedals. The Rock and Roll Trainer itself, look, I'm not quite sure rocking and rolling is the next big thing in indoor trainers. It felt okay in the saddle. It gets a little bit of uh, a relief, I guess, as it's rocking around. The sprints themselves are very unnatural. Outside, when you're sprinting, you sort of use balance and the bike leverage to gather yourself underneath the pedals and put maximum power down and keep in a straight line. Indoors, your torso is very still, but it's the bike that's moving. So things are just a little bit awkward indoors. Even with the steer, it's... Just not the same, there's still work to be done there. It's just not my thing just yet. The overall ride feel and pedal stroke wasn't too bad with this unit. It did take me back 10 years when I had a road machine and that was my go-to indoor trainer for TT sessions. So some trainers do feel like they're pedaling in mud. This has got quite a bit of kick over to it, so not too bad. Okay, we'll wrap it up there. There's my take on the new in-ride power sensor update from Kinetic, which is still keeping trainers over 10 years old relevant today. Not bad. Okay, thanks for watching. We'll be back with more soon.